Good morning viewers, uh, welcome to Medical Focus. My name is Verona Dupria. I'm a social worker by profession and I represent my company UniHealth. And we are going to discuss a very interesting topic today. We are going to focus on suicide prevention because we are in September and it is World Suicide Prevention Day. It was on 15 September and we are creating awareness through this program and next month on the 10th of, of October will be World Mental Health Day. So our topic will be informative and for now I will introduce our panel starting from Iani. Good morning everyone, I'm clinical psychologist Iani de Kok working in private practice. And good morning everyone, I'm John Stakler. I'm a, an economist or statistician. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Lee Ann Black. I'm a social worker working for the Ministry of Health and Social Services. Um, good morning, viewers. I'm Zel Nadia Deval. I'm a program manager at Lifeline Childline at our, uh, our counseling center, and I'm a social worker by profession. We will now go for a quick break. Please, viewers, stay tuned in. Um, Iyani, I would like you to talk a little bit about what is a profession clinical psychologist, just to give an, us an overview. Um, what you are doing as a clinical psychologist and uh, what indicates to you what depression is? Well, clinical psychology is a field, um, I really love the word silkinder, and mm. it really is like the art of really understanding our souls but what makes us human. But clinical psychology particularly, the clinical refers to that we treat pathology, so mental illness, but then really, um, I think for myself and a lot of psychologists, we prefer the preventative mo model of positive psychology, so which is really the decimation of information like we are doing today in order to give people information, knowledge and skills to, set, to stay um, mentally resilient, mentally healthy, rather than waiting until someone has depression. And what is depression? I think depression is one of the mental illnesses that's the least understood but the most mm. prevalent. And I think if we're also looking at suicide, we know that about 40% of people who have participated in the study said that they experience depression. But we don't know what depression is. Mm. And depression really is, is uncontrollable <coughs> sadness. So it's when we have a sadness or we have a loss of pleasure. So mm -hmm. things that you used to enjoy, maybe gardening or playing soccer, you just don't have fun. You don't enjoy those things anymore. And then we also see, of course, that there's um, an, an impact on your concentration, your focus, so we're struggling with that. Struggling with sleep, so staying asleep, falling asleep, Often we have issues with um, weight gain or weight loss without trying. So it just happens. It's not like you're going on a diet or you're eating more. It just happens. And then we have excessive feelings of guilt or shame. Really this overthinking, you know, when you can't switch that internal voice off. And it really can lead to then, you know, thoughts of suicide and then eventually even like the act of taking your own life. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. John Steitler. Um, I recently saw something on Facebook and that is also your relevance today to highlight a little bit of your own story and how men, you know, are looked at when they are suffering from depression. So why is your interest as an economist in the field of um, psychology, specifically depression, uh, wh what is your story behind it? Yes, uh, Verona, I don't actually know where to start, mm -hmm. but uh, as usual, in, in many instances, we have a trigger event. So what, what I've realized is that some things build up over time, but you don't realize what's happening. And often as a professional, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that I'm working too much because you put in extra hours, mm -hmm. high demanding job, and 
then you think it's just tiredness and mm. uh, and it will go away and, and you think I will just have to take a break even just for a few days and, and but when you take a break you can't switch off and uh, what trigger my uh, interest in in this topic is was incidentally also in the month of October, six years ago, where my sister was diagnosed with cancer, and it was stage four cancer. It, uh, and at the same time, I was so much into my work. And as Iana said, when, when my sister then succumbed to cancer, there, there was a lot of guilt I, I experienced the, the loss of a sibling in a different way. I, I've experienced loss of my parents, but I never thought that the loss of a sibling will affect me more than the loss of my mm. parents. I, I suddenly realized this, but it was my older sister, that she's the person that has known me from birth, that we fight as siblings. We, we normally siblings don't always have the best of relationship. Mm. And at at the day of a funeral, uh, it struck me that my sister did not die because of cancer. I it struck me that day my sister died because of loneliness. And if you get diagnosed with cancer, in the beginning there's a lot of sympathy. But then after three years, it almost becomes like a burden. Friends to everybody. And I realize how lonely my sister must have been. And, that, and until today I believe that it was not cancer, it was the loneliness. And that created a lot of guilt in me, and I had to, to deal with it until today. But I reflected also on my relationships, not just with her, but, but with the rest of my family, with friends, at a workplace. Uh, and then I decided one day I will tell the story of what I've gone through. And, but it took me three years to speak about it. Uh, so, it's. I've also seen a psychologist, uh, and I was actually, and Yana will know better diagnosis. There's depression. There's also burnout. It's very related. Mm -hmm. But but officially, my psychologist told me, John, you suffer from a burnout, and it has clouded my judgment and. It has clouded the way I saw reality. And it, it started to also interfere in my relationships, you know. You just get itchy, jittery, angry, snap quickly. I'm lucky that I took a break and that eventually I could uh, continue again. But, uh, but even, even, even after that, it's not, it's not easy. You continue to deal with it. It's people th also think you go and see a psychologist, you get a tablet. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So, so basically that's, that has triggered it. Then uh, coming back to the question of men, as you can see here, we are fortunately maybe, because <laughs> most other panels will have men talk. <laughs> but here we have one man in the panel. <laughs> So that already shows that mm. how men handle yeah. guilt and how they handle stress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's still taboo to some extent. And I also wanted to come out and say, look, uh, real men, they do talk about problems. Real men are also men that can show emotions. And I've drawn a lot of solace in in my relationship with God, and I've 
I've looked again at the person that was one of the realest men was Christ uh, that has gone probably also through depression but if you look at his life it was a roller coaster he cried he was a human being and so I think as men we should not be shy to show our emotions and to talk Thank you, John, for that touching story. Mm -hmm. And it really touched on so many areas of our lives. Um, and I know that there are a lot of viewers that can actually um, relate to what you are going through. And um, I believe that there are many outside there that see the symptoms on their family, in the, in the family members. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, John mentioned Leanne about burnout, and Yanni mentioned about um, anger and um, lots of other factors. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in terms of your specialization, in terms of substance abuse, uh, you are currently working at Etika Meno Rehabilitation Center for the treatment of alcohol and drug abuse. And how does substance abuse actually contributed to mental illnesses or how is it related to mental illnesses? Can you highlight that for us? Yeah, um, thank you, Verona. Um, I think substance abuse and, and mental health, um, especially mental health treatment, is really affected a lot and you find a lot of challenges with mental health treatment if there is substance use um, involved. Um, we can say that some, in, in some cases uh, substance use uh, also affects or um, causes certain mental health issues or induces certain mental, mental health issues uh, because you find that substance use, there are certain substance, substances uh, like the hallucinogens, those ones that maybe cause you to hallucinate, that will sometimes, um, uh, it's, it's also very linked to mental health issues. If, if you have, uh, say, schizophrenia, uh, you also go through or experience similar um, symptoms. Um, so there's quite a, 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 a link between substance use and mental health. Also, uh, with mental health, you find that some people will self-medicate. Um, so sometimes you find that someone realizes they are not like everyone around them. They have certain moods, certain feelings that they are not able to share with everyone because they feel the people will not be able to understand what they are going through. And they then start using a substance in order to self-medicate, to make them feel better, to make them feel a bit more normal. Um, so we can see that this causes quite a bit of challenges, especially with mental health, because of its mood-altering effect. So it changes your mood. Um, and that's the same thing that happens with mental health. Um, so the co-occurring disorders is, is quite a bit of a problem. We also find that, um, and if we look specifically at suicide at this point, suicide, um, one of the risk factors for suicide is substance use and the increased substance use. And you would find that it also affects a lot of the other risk factors. Uh, if you are using substances, uh, you are more likely to have family problems and then also isolate yourself from the family because you feel like they don't understand what you are going through. And the family also feel like you are doing certain things that we cannot condone or we cannot work with. Um, so they, it also contributes to the other risk factors, making a person so much more vulnerable um, to mental health issues uh, making a person so much more vulnerable to suicide. Yes. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so, Nadia, you are working with the heart <laughs> of our country. You are working with our children. 
and you are special specializing in child protection and you are representing Lifeline. And when you look at the topic discussed today in terms of depression and suicides, um, what is your viewpoint taking us, taking us home? <laughs> Take us to a scenery of what you experience as a social worker where children are suffering from depression, where children are <coughs> taking their lives. Uh, telling us as a country what's going on in that household. Mm. Why is it happening? Verona, thank you. Um, I would first like to say from Liani's statistics, um, one life lost is one life too much, especially when it comes to self-harm. And um, usually this time of the year, I don't know if it's because, um, and I, I'm, I'm glad John mentioned burnout, September, October is where everybody is overwhelmed, everybody is tired. And I think with, with women and children especially, um, if you look at uh, pre-COVID, and I want to now touch a bit on COVID, um, is because already we had um, disrupted households, already have we had challenges uh, with women and children in households. And uh, now looking at post-COVID, I think post-COVID or during this COVID period, things have just worsened. Mm. Um, people were laid <coughs> off work, financial losses, um, grief, and, and taking into consideration also, we did not, we couldn't deal the normal way with our losses. Um, we all, I don't want to touch on the COVID deaths and funerals. Mm. So adding to already traumatic stress that women and children are faced with, um, if you just take women, women that go through rape, childhood rape, um, children that go through um, suffering um, violence and bullying and online, there's, there's so many pressure that our children have to deal with on a daily basis. And they are just being silent. So, our children, imagine a child of 15 years old, so much youth, so much to look forward to um, in this life, and you already feel hopeless and helpless, whereas you have so much energy that you, can gen that you generate. I think youth are full of energy. And if they don't generate that energy on a health out in a healthy way, um, th they're just going to feel w hopeless and helpless. So for so many, there's no clarity in their lives. There's no balance. So if there's no clarity and balance, it means that they don't know how to, how to deal with the two. And this is why so many of our youth, so many of our children suffer rejection. Um, they suffer um, disrupted household, like I said before, where parents don't know how to deal with each other. Uh, we find a lot of co-parenting um, we find a lot of child-hated households and within those child-hated households there's a lack of finances there's a lack of so many and the pressure is on with our children in terms of um, peer pressure so our children don't know how to cope and and it comes back to our parenting styles that our parents don't know how to cope ourselves first of all so we don't know how to teach our children healthy coping mechanisms. So it's so many things that, and, and, and we get calls on a daily basis. And especially this month of September through our 116 and our 106 lines of people wanting to commit suicide because they just feel the pressure is too much. They just feel helpless and hopeless. And we have to find ways of, um, just yesterday we had a case of a 20 year old um, student and and you know the case mechanism is so many pointers that you can put, that you can show out um, with or draw out on what this girl went through um, and and there's so much to mention rejection from family rejection from us as professionals um, not being able to help somebody so you are you are being shown from one service provider to another. And this also makes our people feel that the system is failing us. So if there's nobody that can help me, well, my life is just, um, I don't see myself moving forward. Mm. So I'm just touching a bit here and there on, on, you know, just giving on the ground what is happening, why our people or why our children and women especially are suffering in silence. 
Uh, viewers, you have heard Zanadia speaking about our beautiful country. With, we have such a be beautiful range of children from different cultures, from different backgrounds. If you look at children today, don't look at them as just naughty. Look at them with compassion. We will take a break now. We are back here with our topic, suicide and suicide prevention and mental health. And the idea is actually to create awareness and to share some information uh, to our viewers. And we have a lovely panel this morning. Um, Iani, um, can you highlight to us uh, a little bit on the statistics in terms of our country and just uh, profiling to us who are more at risk and what is the current status in terms of our situation should be we we be worried um, are we still okay and how is the country doing certainly verona um as we joined by this wonderful panel of professionals i'm sure we all agree that one of the biggest missing ingredients in our country is data mm. and statistics and it's very difficult to plan the way forward if we don't know what the status quo is so a few years ago um, we were working on a national suicide strategy along with the uh, ministry of health and social services and they produced the very first Namibian report on the status quo of what suicide looks like in our country and keeping in mind th these statistics are from 2011 to 2015 this report was compiled in 2017 released in 2019 here we are in 2021 with a global pandemic so keeping this in mind that the statistics we'll discuss they're a little dated and that we have to consider the impact of what we have collectively as a society and as a nation been going through um, but your, your blatant question of are we okay, the answer is no, no we're not. Um, globally, we know that the statistics are about 22.4% of people for every 100,000 people take their own lives. In Namibia, we are double that. So our statistics are about double the global average, which makes us fourth in Africa in terms of suicidality and 11th in the world. Sure. And this was before before we had corona. And looking at specifically the data by that, um, and I'm sure all our listeners at home, I'm sure you know someone who has died by suicide mm. in the last year, two years. Mm. And we know from the report that about 22%, so that's one out of every five people, had lost a non-family member, and one out of 10 lost a family member. And this was before the global pandemic. And me personally, in the last year, I've lost two close friends. I can't tell you how many other people I know about, and I'm sure we all feel the same. So maybe looking more 
in detail in what it looks like on the ground in Namibia. Um, we know that in terms of the regions, bet between 2011 and 2015, the regions with the highest rates of, of death by suicide was Oshana, which is on Dwepa, Ongawena, and the Hardab regions. And while I was also still working at Lifeline Shadowline, we used to travel the regions asking people these questions, and I would ask, why these regions? And a lot of people would say it's because they're migratory routes. So people are away from their family. And again, when John spoke about death by loneliness, by isolation, mm -hmm. this is really what it is. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. self-harm and death by suicide from people who are isolated and disconnected and alone. And then um, I think the big question is age groups, if we want to look at who's at risk. And globally, we know the people most at risk are adolescents and then also the elderly that are ill. The situation in is actually very different. So our most risk at risk age groups are here from 20 to 35, particularly looking at 30 to 35, which is very strange. That's our most economically active group. So we have to consider that one of the big contributing factors in the movement must be financial. Mm -hmm. And again, to bring it back to our status quo right now, we know how much in unemployment there has been in the last year. So if we had to look at statistics, I'm 100% sure that this would affect what it looks like in our country. And then also looking at gender. So we know that globally we have more women who attempt suicides, but we have men who are more um, successful in their attempts. So more men die by suicide than women. The difference here is adolescence. So when we look at teenagers, and this is until about 18 year old, then we know that more girls die by their own hand than boys. But at older age groups, it really is predominantly, it's our men. It's our men who are not as brave as John to speak up and to seek the help that they need. Um, and then I think we also heard here from Zanadia in terms of the months. And I was joking with some of my colleagues, yes, we have dark humor psychologists, <laughs> about August being October, that October has landed early this year. Mm. Because we've already seen so mm -hmm. many suicidal attempts this year. But in fact, if you look at the statistics, the month in Namibia with yeah. the highest rates of suicidality is actually December. So you think mm -hmm. about it, Christmas, when people are alone and away mm -hmm. from their families, maybe not being able to provide for their families, mm -hmm. to bring that financial aspect in. And then we see it's October and then August. Mm -hmm. So definitely also August. And then also in March. So really, suicidality and, and, and this isolation that we're experiencing is, is here, year round. It's all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think particularly taking care of December to reach out to your community, your neighbors, your family members, just making sure they're connected and they're okay. In terms of the methods, we do see that it's predominantly by your own hand, by hanging. Mm -hmm. And only 5% of people who have attempted a suicidal attempt have left a, a letter. So people don't tell you why. We don't know what the whys are. And I think that's what's so difficult for us as the people who remain, who still live. So maybe looking at the whys. I think that's the most important question for us as a society is to ask why are people deciding to take their own lives? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the six whys that the report found is number one, depression, mm -hmm. which is a mental illness, mm -hmm. which we don't talk about. In mm -hmm. this country, we do mm -hmm. not talk about depression because it's weakness. Mm -hmm. In fact, last year when we had the same conversation with Leanne, I reminded people that your brain is a muscle. So depressive thinking becomes a way that your brain becomes structured that you almost can't help yourself. It is an illness. It is a disease. It's not a choice. So if you are suffering from depression, that's number one reason that would lead people to taking their own lives. Then followed by rejection. Mm -hmm. Again, that isolation, not being belonging. Hopelessness. So not having a plan for the future. So if you speak to your, your colleagues, your friends and you hear they have no plan for the future, there's a sense of helplessness or hopelessness, you know that's a red flag. And then we know family problems, self-esteem or worthlessness, which is a big one. And we all, just by the very nature of being God's children, deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. But so many people have a sense of worthlessness. Mm -hmm. um, and then wanting, it's a way to communicate, wanting other people to know your pain. But we also know that these reasons, that's not where it begins. It's never where it begins. So these things are triggers. And I think the main triggers that they also identified was 
relationships ending, breakups, mm -hmm. followed by, let's see, financial issues, family issues, and the death of a loved one, as well as then verbal and physical mm -hmm. abuse. Yeah. And if you think about mm -hmm. financial issues and a loved of a death one, how many people have been affected in the last year? Mm -hmm. So I think we really are, we can be expecting not just a pandemic of corona, but a pandemic of suicide mm -hmm. to follow and to take it one step deeper. When they also looked at the, the past experiences, so we're looking at your formative years, your teenage years, when you're young, the past experiences of people who've attempted or considered suicide, we're looking at 40% of them report having been bullied mm -hmm. as kids. So if us as a society want to address suicide, we have to address bullying yeah. in school. Yes. We have to address abuse in a household because if a woman is abusing her husband or her husband is abusing his wife, the kids will learn to abuse other kids at school. Mm -hmm. So we have to address bullying. And then we also really, the other thing that they were talking about is emotional regulation. So not being able to control your feelings and this leading to aggressive or angry outbursts. So getting in fights or being in fights. So again, we're looking at emotional regulation. That's a psychological factor. So teaching our kids how to sit with sadness, how to express our pain. And these are not things we just tell kids or we tell people overall, oh, you'll be okay, don't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. But creating spaces for people to have these conversations. So yes, um, just really looking at those factors, I think that's where we would have to address um, our, our mm -hmm. national attempts. Yes, Iani, you have created a picture and a pro mm. profile for our country. And I hope and believe that there are viewers who are sitting in different positions. You are a, a chairperson, you are a manager, you are a CEO. And you know on which area you can also improve or where you can contribute to address um, the mental health burden and also suicide prevention um, amongst us, especially now. The frontline workers and the teachers, there's a lot, there is in every sector, there was a burden of just emotional, physical burnout uh, to actually run the country during COVID, to make tough decisions during COVID. Um, it took a lot and it, it, that goes back to family because our, our firm belief is in our family. And unfortunately, those people closest to us are hurting. They are bleeding they are suffering. We might be in a very esteemed position, but when we take our breakdowns and our pain, we take it home mm -hmm. and they suffer mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. And um, John, you had a very touching story um, and I'm going to the, the, the caveman now. Mm -hmm. So how are men actually, you told your story, but what in general, um, how are men dealing in terms of mental illnesses? How do they do it? And, how do, you, how do you think we can maybe understand better um, and assist better? Um, how do they mm. view mental illnesses? Um, you have been through this journey mm. and you actually mentioned that you were in um, uh, getting services from a psychologist and from um, a, a caveman, the lions. So how are they roaring? Mm. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I, I just before coming to the specific question, I, I wanted to let on an issue that Iani raised and mm -hmm. also Zialnia. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look, Iani, at the causes of death in Namibia, there is the mortality report that the NSA compiles. And this is a beautiful report in a sense that it gives additional data. Mm -hmm. But uh, I recall when I was statistician general, we released the mortality of death report. And before releasing the report, I looked at it and I saw that there's a lot of violent causes of death. Mm -hmm. uh, suicide, death by suicide that time was, uh, I think number two or three, but it was way up there. Uh, and the others was, uh, murder, you know, mm. knife steps. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of violence. That, and I've asked myself, is Namibia a very violent society? Is violence the only way we can express ourselves? I, I don't know the answer to it, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned something, there's a pandemic coming, and mm -hmm. I see it like a tsunami. Mm -hmm. 
and we better be prepared for it now. We, we speak of economic recovery plan, but even if the economy recover, the, the outburst will come and it's going to be massive. Mm -hmm. And, and we, have a, we, we can learn from history. Uh, one of the things that I've always said is that Namibia was never classified as a post-conflict society at independence. Mm -hmm. uh, some other countries, they, they classified mm -hmm. as post-conflict, but there was a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. It, but at the same time, there was no, in years where you say, maybe the system, people think the system failed. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have to ask that question. Does the system really serve people? Could the system have come up with a national dialogue mm -hmm. on how to handle the conflict and the issues, the emotional issues that's either related to the violent past that we've come from, through the economic depression that we are currently going through, uh, where, where do you turn to? They, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And the system is overwhelmed. There is very little resources in the system. It's, I, I reach out to, to a private psychologist, but mm -hmm. the ordinary person mm -hmm. doesn't know where to turn to. Mm -hmm. uh, so men generally will just play it down and then say, I have to find a way. Uh, the other issue we have to look at very closely for the future is if you look at a boy child. Mm -hmm. You know, we have invested a lot in the girl child and I see some good outcomes, but we are still not where we should be. But if you look at a boy child, if you look at a, the graduates at university currently, they are up, sometimes up to 70% yeah. female. Mm -hmm. So, so we, are, we are creating a boy child that is going to be probably a very violent boy child and that's mm -hmm. not understood and that will find the only way is to go to the jungle and survive on the street. But as Verona said, it will come back to the, to the home. Mm -hmm. Viewers, um, I hope you are tuned in and uh, we will take a small break. Please uh, go on and uh, watch us also online and um, we will take a small break now. Leanne, you are specializing in substance abuse um, and I know there are a lot of people sitting outside there and wondering what is Namibia actually offering in mm -hmm. terms of help and solutions, where can they take their family members and you have alluded previously that uh, substance use um, contributes to suicide, to depression, 
Um, so what are you actually offering in terms of your facility? Yeah. Yes, Verona, I would like to also uh, take a minute and think about the, the theme for suicide prevention at this point uh, for this year is uh, creating hope through action. And I think it, it fits so well with what are we doing as a country and uh, to what uh, John was saying and Iani as well. Um, it's, it's really that we, we, we need to look at this not just from a perspective of uh, the government, psychologists, uh, specific uh, treatment facilities. I, I have special appreciation for John being here because he's a stat statistician. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really, it, it hits in so many areas and on so many levels that we, we should look at it as a we problem, not just a problem for a specific uh, discipline. And with that, I say that the, the ministry has quite a few things happening at this point. With the rehabilitation center, uh, we see people with substance use uh, problems, but we also, um, we also treat or make sure that people who have a co-occurring disorder um, is assisted with the other disorder that could be contributing to their substance use problem. Um, so we take quite a bit of uh, a multidisciplinary approach to substance use. We don't just look at substance use, we actually do look at um, the other problems that contribute to it. Um, the mental health unit also has quite a few programs running. Um, I think Comas region recently launched the task force, the, the regional task force. This task force is, is uh, I think people should get involved on a regional level uh, and it will be rolled out to other regions as well because we want it to be a decentralized activity where people actually deal with the problems they are experiencing in a specific region. As we heard from the statistics, it's not just that everyone is experiencing the same problem at the same time, but in different regions, people experience things differently. And that's why you would find suicide is probably uh, higher in a specific region at a specific time. Um, by now, uh, the, the, the landscape could be changing again, mm -hmm. and another region could be uh, uh, topping uh, on suicide. And we would really want a suicide-free uh, suicide uh, community. We, we want, because it's preventable, we can prevent suicide. So we want each and every region to be able to say that they are suicide-free. One year we can, or f from year on, because it's treatable, we, we can uh, report mm -hmm. that we are suicide-free. There's no suicides in Namibia. Um, I think what, what we can also expect is that we, we, we could go for a mental health uh, first aid um, approach in that community members can get involved. You know, it's so difficult for community members to uh, approach someone that they feel that this person could be struggling with something or I see this person is not doing well. And you find or you sit with so much regret afterwards thinking that I could have done something. I saw the warning signs and I didn't do something. And mental health first aid can really assist with, you know, building confidence, but also with um, creating a professional environment where you are able to approach someone um, with the right information, the right referral system, and also know that, okay, this person could be suffering from this, so this is where I can refer them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, for the community, I think this is an approach that, that they should grab onto um, with the, uh, the suicide task force, the regional suicide task force, and make sure that they equip themselves mm -hmm. um, on dealing with mental health. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Leanne. Um, I, the ministry is quite uh, striding in terms of mental health and substance abuse prevention and treatment, and it's also their domain. 
So there's a lot that the ministry is offering, but um, as there's a call also out to churches and NGOs and FBOs, private sector um, workplaces to also play a role and to assist the ministry in terms of those services. Um, we have our uh, lines, um, Lifeline, child line, um, it's screened for people to contact and they will refer us to the, to the right service provider. Um, Zal Nadia, um, we talk about children and this is what you specialize in. And in terms of just for parents, um, if you can just give us an overview of how they could be assisted um, and what services you are currently rendering and um, how they can make contact uh, of your services um, so that parents who are sitting there who don't have the skills, who don't have the knowledge, and as John has alluded previously, um, you know, it's expensive to go to private. How can they make uh, use of your services? Um, Farona, thank you so much. I think it's, I want to echo what everybody have said. Um, I think this is a very hot topic and it's a very, um, something that we can just never get enough of mm -hmm. um, stressing on, echoing on, on what our country is suffering. And Lifeline Childline, um, being in the midst of Namibia for 40 years now, mm -hmm. um, so we do have, and we're the only organization with um, helplines, toll free. So, and we do include a full package of, um, we do have a department that provides parenting training for free. Mm -hmm. So there are parenting trainings currently in our regions going on with um, counselors. So parenting is also a very, like John earlier said, the, it shows in the package how to deal with conflict, how to deal with the past, um, how to co positively co-parent. Um, so there's, there's, there's so much that Lifeline Childline provides in a whole package. Um, so I want to stress out there that parents should not suffer alone. Parents should not sit in isolation and not know what to do. They can contact Lifeline Childline um, for services. And like I said before, and I always stress it, it's for free. Because even still yesterday, somebody asked me, so don't I have to pay anything? No, Lifeline Childline um, do provide services for free. So our lines are also open from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, during the COVID, um, we did extend our lines to 10 o'clock in the evening. Um, but what we found is that we were expecting a lot of calls to come through because of... Um, but I was saying, I think we will face the tsunami mm -hmm. only afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get ready to open our lines 24 hours um, post-COVID because this is where our people will feel the pressure. Um, so we do provide face-to-face -face counseling as well um, at our head office. So you can just come in any time. Um, we do provide face-to-face -face counseling. We do provide telephonic counseling. And now with COVID, COVID have learned us a lot of new. Um, so we do provide virtual counseling. We do provide to organizations. Um, we have now started uh, providing EAP services to companies because a lot of companies came to us saying our staff members are burned out there. You are sitting in a board member, a board meeting and a member will just burst out and cry, but don't you care about my feelings? So they've realized our people need attention. Our people need psychosocial support. So yes, we do have an inclusive package from children to parents to professionals that, that we provide um, a service to. So back again to Leanne, um, I want to stress and echo that it's all of us of our responsibility to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. We cannot blame the government. Mm -hmm. We cannot blame professionals. Mm -hmm. Each of us need to be an entry point, um, need to be that entry point to a referral system. You don't need the skills to talk to somebody and just guide them through this whole feelings, this whole emotions. And then you can um, refer them to professional services. So yes, Lifeline Childline, we do have social workers, we do have um, psychologists, and we do have counselors that can provide services to our Namibia nation. So we don't have to suffer out there alone. No, we don't have to. Thank you, Zelnadia. And as Leanne has said also previously, uh, suicide is preventable. And um, 
Leanne has also said there's a, a, a lot of volunteers needed. Um, we need people that can assist the ministry. We need people that can assist churches, uh, <coughs> faith-based organizations, non-governmental organizations. If you're there and you want to do something for our country, there's a cry out this morning. Um, Iani has talked about loneliness. We say we are African nation. We say we care about people. We say uh, we are the brave land. We are the country of different colors and cultures and we embrace it. But can we also embrace it in terms of love and care mm -hmm. and also rendering some services? Can we look at our neighbor and our employee, our coworker, our housekeeper, those who jump the bus, who jump, who jump the taxi? Can we look at them in a different way? This morning we want, let us reflect a little bit of even our children, how we look at them, how we look at people, how we can easily so be judgmental. Can we reflect a little bit on that this morning? Iani, we want to wrap up a little bit. Um, a few last words from you, please, and then from the panel also. Well, I think one more last thing that stood out for me in the report is that a lot of Nubians have seeked help. So they've tried to talk to their family members or they've tried to talk to their pastor. Mm. But they simply report that they didn't feel understood and they were not helped. Mm. And I think the fact is most people in civil society don't actually have the skills mm. to talk about suicide. And I've, mm. I've found that people will say, like, Ugh, we don't talk about these things. Don't talk about that. Mm. And you'll be fine. You'll feel better tomorrow. Mm. And I think that is so invalidating for mm. that person who's trying to share their pain. Mm. So I know that no one out there is really trained, like we are trained, we study seven years to help people with this. But mm. if I can just say, try not to give advice. Mm. Try not to say tomorrow will look better. What we can do is we can sit there and we can say, I am here for you. Mm. Tell me your pain. Why mm. do you want to die? Actually let them express why they feel so helpless and so hopeless that they want to end it because they don't want to die. They are just feeling so overwhelmed and tired. So give them that space to unpack. Ask them, but why, what's still keeping you alive? We mm. call this ambivalence. Work on what's keeping them alive and then tell them this line. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to help but I am here for you. Mm -hmm. I love you, I care, I'm here mm -hmm. for you. And let me get you professional help mm -hmm. if you can. And I think on that last point of professional help, we know there's not enough mm -hmm. professional help. Mm -hmm. So I would like to call upon the whole nation and really emphasize Leanne's point of mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest gap in our country compared to South Africa, Australia, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world is mental health first aid, which includes people on the ground, our pastors, our lay counselor, Lifelike Childline, trying to get more skills out there to the populace so we can, as Verona suggested, as a nation, be there for each other. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for this whole panel and for this conversation, such an important conversation. John. Oh, okay. Um, maybe just two, three points. Firstly, a report like the one that you presented uh, and generally data should be a call to action. Mm -hmm. And this report must be a call to action to all of us. Mm -hmm. But I think given the gravity of the situation, we need more a national drive that mm -hmm. should be headed by the central government. And that must be coordinated and systematic. And linked to that, I think the Ministry of Basic Education and the Education Ministry should play a key role in that national drive. Uh, because this is the future that we are talking about. And in the past, we used to have guidance counselors at schools. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they are still there. Yes. But if not, if they are still there, they should be better equipped. Because during my days, they did a lousy job. <laughs> 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 they were often <laughs> not the best trained. Uh, I, but I was at school long ago, so the situation <laughs> might have changed. But we need really people at the school level that mm -hmm. should be the champion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of suicide prevention. And uh, not just career guidance. It's, it, should be, it should be more than that. And then uh, finally, we have to start Charity starts at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but before finally, the, the business sector must come also on board. Mm -hmm. The Chamber of Commerce, the business associations, 
There's no time to narrate the story of the GIZ, but I think businesses must know that mm -hmm. uh, they should not disinvest on this particular. I know it's a difficult time, mm -hmm. but here they should not spend less. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, John. Uh, Leanne? Yeah, um, I so really <laughs> like what, what, what is being discussed. And yes, uh, suicide and mental health should not be an extra, extra optional. Uh, it should really be uh, a priority uh, in our country at this point. We can see that we can't afford uh, not to make it a priority. Um, with that, I would like to also tie in with uh, John in saying that you know, we often see men in our society as the strong men. They are not supposed to cry. They are not supposed to have help, help seeking behavior. Uh, otherwise, they are seen as weak. And really, we should take a look at our cultures, our beliefs, mm -hmm. our religions, and see what practices are we having and what are we doing in our practices that really promote that strong man culture, mm -hmm. uh, making men. Uh, putting pressure on them to perform and not to be able to show vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And we should address that and create platforms where they actually can come together and feel free and feel safe mm -hmm. to share and to seek for help. That's Thank you, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Zander. from my side, it's, it's just about the protection of children. It's, um, this is our future. And if we look at fatherlessness, um, it, it creates um, opportunity for self-harm. If, 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 um, if we don't deal with conflict of the past, with violence, then I foresee um, a tsunami, like we said earlier. And um, I believe in the strengthening and coordination of services um, to improve the lives of Namibians. Because if we work in isolation, we will never achieve um, any positive results. So yes, that's all from my side. And I just think that we shouldn't have preventative um, awareness raisings only in October, mm -hmm. but it should be looked at throughout the rest of mm -hmm. the year and not mm -hmm. just a certain period of the year, mm -hmm. but throughout January until December. Because like Yanni said, the statistics, um, it's throughout the year. It's not mm -hmm. just October. Uh, where it was maybe prevalent earlier, but now it, it's throughout the year. So I would have us to look, or the task force to look at preventative measures throughout the year. That's all from my side, yes. Thank you. You are a wonderful team um, and panel of expertise. Um, Iani, Dr. John Steitler, uh, Leanne Black and Zelnadia. We want to thank you for bringing this topic so eloquently with so much empathy and um, all the viewers, all the listeners, um, thank you for tuning in. And we will definitely see you in future. Have a lovely day. Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>